right, seven people are here. Welcome. Um, we'll give like a couple minutes just to get more people signed up. I think we have 18 in the class, so we'll just see who rolls in in the next few minutes. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you'd like. I'm going to step aside for just a moment, um, but I'll be right back and we'll jump in in a couple minutes. All right. Hi, Jewel. This is your second class with the Odin, I think. So welcome back. Hello, Lindsay and Chris. Chris, you're a neighbor. I'm in Austin as well. How is the volume for everybody? Can you hear me OK? All right, so the volume is good. I got one affirmative comment. Okay, great. So, got nine people watching. Um, just give it a couple more minutes before I dive in, um, but I'll start introducing how this is gonna work. So this class is gonna be mostly an introduction to fungi as a kingdom, as organisms. And then we will go for a demo. Um, we're gonna do how to clone fungal tissue and then what to do with your syringes. You can totally follow along with the syringes. Uh, basically, we are just gonna take those cultures that you got in your kit and inject them into the grain bags. It's very straightforward. The cloning part, I recommend that you just watch and do that on your own time because you'll need to make the agar to do that. Um, and we're not gonna go over that in this class, but there will be a video that shows you how to do that in the Google Classroom. Um, and that'll be uploaded by the end of the day. And that's definitely more involved, so just hold off until you're ready and you have a good amount of time and you can set aside um, a good chunk of the day or uh, do it at night and in the morning clone. So, all right. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I have some slides to share as I lecture you through what a fungus is. Okay. If permissions. Uh oh. Okay. Um, all right, I might have to end my Google to uh, give it permission. I'm so sorry. I'm gonna try to bypass that, but it's possible. Oh wait, can you guys see this? Yes, looks like you can. Great. Okay. So we are now at how many people? Eighteen, great. That's exactly as how many signed up. So awesome. All right, so mycology one hundred and one. So there's a lot of information available to you online about mycology one hundred and one. But what the Odin wants to do, what we really want to do, is 
bring new perspectives to this and sort of educate from a more scientific view because a lot of this is coming from the farming perspective or uh, you know just people working with fungi uh, for cultivation but less in biotechnology and we will discuss how to work with fungi in biotech not in today's class that's going to be later on today is all about just understanding what this thing is because it is really different from other organisms that we are all familiar with like plants animals and maybe even bacteria if you have worked with an odin kit before or um, have done any sort of microbiology so as many of you might know they are their own kingdom but it's really interesting to point out that although they are put into the microbiology department you know if you pursue mycology in academia, you will be studying it in the microbiology department. But they are so far away from bacteria, genetically speaking. They're so much closer to plants and animals. Um, so yeah, that's worth pointing out because we tend to work with fungi much like we work with bacteria. And there's a lot that gets uh, overlooked because of that. Um, I kind of think of them more like pets, but they're somewhere in between. Again, they're their own thing. And some biological features that fungi, all fungi have that are usually unique to fungi are the following. So they're all eukaryotic, which means they have a membrane-bound nucleus. That really sets them apart from bacteria. Also, most fungi are multicellular. So Yeast is an example where they are unicellular, but you know this, this is an organism that transcends the microcosm and the macrocosm. Like they start off as a spore, but as they grow and you see them on the plate, that is a single organism that you can now notice with your human eye. So they do kind of straddle this line between micro and macro. And then of course, there's the case of the mushroom where it's very obvious, you can hold it, you can smell it, it's on this plane with us. So most fungi are going to be filamentous and that means that their cells divide and they just grow in these little thread-like morphologies. Uh, the apical growth thing, that basically just means that when they're branching off, they're, they're not branching from their tips only. They're kind of like a plant in the way that right behind their apex, they will continue to branch and branch and branch. And if a hyphae ever gets um, cut or it, it gets broken up in some way, that space will go crazy with apical growth. Um, so it's kind of a defense mechanism. And they just, you know, are, their whole goal is to just grow and grow and grow and in no determined morphologies, like they're, they're miners and they're foragers, so they will go in and out and through and under things indefinitely uh, to get access to the foods that they are after. And by the way, if you guys want to ask questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but I will make sure to have 10 minutes or so at the end uh, for more questions, and we can just focus on talking then. Um, uh, they're also heterotrophs, so this is apart from plants, you know, they're allotrophs. Plants can make their own food. They're like molecular uh, creators of food, which is really, really interesting and super cool. But like us, fungi have to find food that pre-exists. They don't make it. Um, they're also, their cell walls are made of chitin and glucan. Chitin is something you find abundantly in the animal kingdom, mostly in like crustaceans and exoskeletons of insects, things like that. So it's this very tough material. Now mycelium is really small. Uh, each cell is something like 13 uh, micro nanometers, and you definitely need a microscope to see an individual cell. But that, as as a whole matrix can be a really strong material and that's something that's really being explored today and we will get into in next in the next class um, fungi also typically have haploid nuclei so for the fungi that we're going to work with 
they usually have two nuclei in their cells. Both are haploids. And when they reproduce, they'll create a spore with one or both of those nuclei. It's very rare to find um, diploid fungal nuclei, especially like within the phylums that we're going to be interested in, which I'll explain more in the next slide or the next two slides. And they typically make spores. That's how they reproduce. So all fungi or all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. And the majority of fungi don't actually make mushrooms, but the whole purpose of this mushroom is to house spores. If you don't make a mushroom, how do, where do you put your spore? Usually that's on the very tip of the mycelium. So that apical growth, that very tip, so molds and things, they'll basically just make like a little sack and house uh, the spore there. And you can see this in like bread molds or if you have worked with microbiology before and you've gotten fungal contamination and you see like some green dusty looking stuff, uh, those are all spores. And they're also twatipitin. So you can kind of think of that like each piece of tissue being a stem cell. You can take tissue from any part of the mushroom or the fungus, put that on agar or just, you know, isolate it from its network, grow it out, and it will still continue to give rise to unlike cells. Now that's not saying a whole lot because cell to cell, the variation in a fungus is not that drastic like a mammal. You know, our skin cells are way different from our kidney cells and things like that. Within a mushroom, that variation is pretty light. But it's still a cool fact and it helps, it, it makes working with fungi a lot easier. And you'll see that when we do the cloning today that you can take from really any segment of your specimen and be confident that you're getting a complete genetic code uh, to keep propagating that particular specimen. And more animal than plant, so like we talked about, they're heterotrophs. This is one of the coolest facts about fungi and I think gives rise to a lot of really interesting applications that we'll cover a little bit later in the slides and definitely later on in the class. But basically, they're metabolizers, so they have to create enzymes to break down the environment around them. And that is some advanced chemistry. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. Um, they're CO2 emitters, just like us. They intake oxygen and let out CO2. They have chitinous cell walls, just like we talked about with um, arthropods and other crust crusty animals. They're genetically more similar, and they contain ranges of carbohydrates and sugars that are also found in arthropods. So the point of this is just to sort of paint the picture that these are very unlike um, plants, and that is definitely like a, a projection that we have today just with farming and everything. Um, it's a completely different biology. And a fun fact is uh, I used to run a Cordyceps militaris farm that we got certified organic. This was in Massachusetts. The Bay State Organic Certifier Agency considered mushrooms to be livestock and not plants because of the way that you had to farm them. And that's basically just that, you know, you, you are giving them a food and they're creating a almost like secondary byproduct like meat. So interesting stuff. Um, here are the three ways that a fungus typically lives. So the most common is going to be the filamentous multicelled. This is the mycelium, um, the mushrooms, the stuff that's in the soil that has relationships with plants and keeps the checks and balances of soil ecology. And then you have single cell things like yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Yes, that's a, that's a fungus and it's extremely abundant. It's a model organism. We work with it here at the Odin. We have a kit that, uh, where you can grow yeast that has GFP in it and it's definitely more familiar in the scientific world. So what we're trying to do now is learn from the yeast and see what we can start doing with filamentous fungi, but ultimately they're, they're pretty different organisms. They can also be dimorphic. So that means that 
they can transition between a yeast-like phase and a filamentous-like phase. Most fungi that are dimorphic tend to be pathogenic. The picture you see on this slide is of candida and most like um, entomopathogenic fungi, so fungi that parasitize insects like cordyceps or you know, any, any kind of parasitic fungus onto an animal is gonna have this ability to go from yeast to uh, filament, which is pretty interesting. Uh, here is what most fun fungal cell walls are gonna look like. There are cases where fungal cell walls contain cellulose. Those tend to be more primitive, primitive fungi and they're really small and you probably won't interact with them anytime soon um, unless you're studying something more niche within the mycology world. But this is what it looks like. So it's pretty involved. Uh, it's tough stuff. You know, we've, we've worked with some enzyme treatments on fungal cells and there, there's a lot to learn. It's, it's exciting stuff, but important to consider. This is what's called the Spitzen Corpor. So this is, this is a zoomed in infographic of a hyphal tip um, in the middle of expansion. And the Spitzen Corpor is this little ball of vacuoles that you see at the tip. And that basically just denotes where the movement is happening in the fungal cell. Um, as far as I know, the actual mechanics of what gives the fungus the strength to push through things like rocks and other really tough materials is not understood very well. But um, yeah, this is a, a nice picture just to show you how complex they really are, even though they're so tiny. Um, here's a small video of some microscopy I was doing. Uh, for a fungus called Armillaria. It's actually one of the largest fungi in the world, or largest organism by acreage. Uh, it lives in Oregon. And you can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's pretty obvious where, you're, where the septum is. And that's basically just the lines in between cells. So that, there's, there's a, a wall there and a little kind of plug situation that the fungus will exchange cytoplasm from one cell to another. And this is really beneficial because say one cell gets infected with something, it'll turn off that exchange. Basically like there's an organelle called a Waronin body and it plugs it up and does not allow cytoplasmic exchange anymore. Um, and then likewise, if there's a, a network of the fungus that's suffering or that encountered something that's challenging it, um, that's, that helpful cytoplasm will just sort of race over there and, you know, give more active production to making defensive chemicals and things like that. Um, I'm going to rewind this a little bit because the reason I started taking this video was I believe I found some endobacterium. There's these little, little dots that are kind of wiggling around in the cell, and I didn't know what they were. I sent this video to a few mycologists, and finally someone confidently responded that this would be endobacteria. So this is another whole field of mycology that's extremely nascent and I think super important, but they have microbiomes, you know? They're, the health of a fungus is totally influenced by not just the ecosystem around it, but inside of it as well. Obviously there's less real estate for bacteria to inhabit. Like you're not gonna find the trillions of, of cells like you'll find in a mammal, but it's still there. And in some fungi, if you take out these bacteria, they just don't even thrive anymore. Or they're really weak and at the slightest offput in their uh, environmental preferences will make them, will kill them or make them go dormant. So that's pretty interesting stuff. We will cover it a little bit more, I think in the third class uh, when we talk about some of the most new science. 
So here are the major phylums. I Taxonomy, great, it's helpful, but there's a lot of drama in the taxonomic world that I'm not trying to get involved with. Um, basically, you've got chytrids, which are super primitive fungi. These are the ones that are gonna have some cellulose in their cell walls, and you find a lot of these in the water. Water molds, they, their spores and some of their cells even have flagella. Um, they were definitely here a, for a very long time before Basidiomycota and Ascomycota. The Zygomycota fungi are the soil fungi. So if you make compost tea or work with any sort of soil remediation, um, these organisms are gonna be super, super important for making that thrive and just be optimal in general. You're gonna find Zygomycota everywhere, Antarctica, any kind of soil that you can imagine, um, they are going to be there. Basidiomycota. So this is the phylum that we're probably all most familiar with. It's the phylum that the three cultures you've got in your kit are from. And they're probably the most understood in terms of a pedestrian perspective because they fruit mushrooms. You know, the oyster mushrooms that you eat, the uh, portobellos that you get at the store, most of these fungi are going to be Mycota. They're easy to work with. Um, they have a less cryptic lifestyle and they'll fruit mushrooms. So there's just a more satisfactory element to it. Not all Basidiomycetes fruit mushrooms, but most of them do. And then you have the more mysterious yet still mushroom forming Ascomycota. So if you recognize that illustration, it's a morel. And Ascomycota is, the asco means ascus, which is Latin for sac. And in a morel, all of those little concave scoops are basically a little spore house. And that's supposed to be the a factor with in all ascomycetes that brings them together is the sac. However, there's also uh, non-mushroom forming ascomycota and yeasts are actually within this uh, phylum. Just gonna see if there's any questions. Okay, so yeah, ascomycota is interesting. Cordyceps militaris is in the ascomycota phylum, which made that mushroom more difficult to work with. And the reason is, um, We'll just show you the simplicity of this Basidiomycota first. So like with, with fungi, the minimum mating types that you have are two, but the maximum is up to 30,000. So that, that's a whole other conversation. But the point is you just need two genetically diverse mating types to come together and they'll fuse. So what you see going on with this dicaryotic mycelium is the germination of mating type one and two. They come together, they fuse, and then they have the genetics within the entire network. So you, took, you take a cell from a basidiomycota petri plate or wherever, you're gonna have a dicaryotic mycelium, which is great, because you know you got all the genetic material that you need. Ascomycota is a little bit different. It doesn't actually fuse until it makes an ascus or a spore sac. However, they still need each other to live in tandem. So you can think of it like humans almost, like you hold hands with your partner, you, you live in tandem together, but you're not actually fusing until you make offspring. And uh, that can, pose a lot of challenges because if you take tissue from an ascomycetes, it's very possible that you'll get most of one mating type and not enough of the other. And then you keep propagating the fungus and you don't get any mushrooms or you get like one mushroom or something, you know, just something funky in general. So the trick to working with ascomycota is to keep your haploids separate and you, you grow out mating type one and two you could see that you have both. And then when you're ready to put them on a final substrate, you have control over the biomass of each mating type that you put in your, you know, like when I was working with cordyceps, I would have a liquid culture of mating type one and mating type two. 
and inoculate the substrate with equal parts of both. But we won't be working with Ascomycota, at least not in this one-on-one class. So ecological roles of fungi, they, what defines this is largely dependent on how it obtains nutrients. So the three cultures we have in the kits, they're all saprophytes, they're decomposers, they tend to eat non-living things. Um, Pinellas stypticus is found growing on hardwoods. The, or the, the Ganoderma slash reishi strain is also found on hardwoods. And then the Pleurotus, um, the oyster mushroom, also hardwoods. So those are pretty easy to farm. That's like generally what you see in the cultivation worlds are saprophytic mushrooms. There's also symbiotes, which are really cool, but they're super difficult to farm because many of them are obligate symbiotes or they just get chemical signals from other organisms. So if you're a mycorrhizal fungus, what that means is you have a relationship with a plant and the roots of the plant and the fungus are in communication and they exchange things. They exchange sugars and uh, minerals and things like that. But there's also so much else going on there. You know, there's got to be growth factors and hormones and things that we don't fully understand. So recreating that in a lab to cultivate is something that many mycologists are attempting to do. But, um, you know, we're not getting too far with that. Morels are actually uh, one of the few mycorrhizal ascomycota mushrooms that we have kind of debunked. Um, They've been doing it in China for a while now, and then it's finally starting to come to the West. And it's, it's pretty cool science that we won't get into now, but if you're interested, just shoot me an email and I've got all kinds of literature on that. And then finally, there's pathogens and parasites. So cordyceps is a classic example, uh, but there's also more cryptic insidious fungi like candida or cryptococcus. So I don't know if you've heard of muromycosis or um, diseases like that, but there are many fungi that in immunocompromised people even, um, it will grow filamentous cells in your lungs or you know, somewhere on your body and uh, fungal infections can be really, really awful. Um, dandruff is an example of a pathogenic fungus, uh, ringworm, yeast infections, obviously, and yeah. Okay. So back to the heterotrophic characteristics of fungi. This is probably one of the most interesting things about fungi to me is that they digest inside out. They're like an inside out stomach. Um, rather than engulfing their food, what they do is secrete enzymes that digest the world around them and then they can selectively intake the compounds that their enzymes digested so that's pretty crazy i mean imagine if you could take your sandwich and like digest it down to like all the necessary compounds that you needed for your biological processes to go on and just pick out only what you needed I mean, that might be the ultimate biohack, right? But it's interesting because they are so simplistic, uh, by lot, or physically speaking, but metab metabolically, they have some of the most wide ranging expressions. Um, and this is what makes them so useful because they come up with chemical solutions for a lot of things. Um, so ways that we've used fungal solutions, chemical solutions, are with cheese, for example. I mean, that's like classic fermentation. Um, beer, wine, and alcohol. These are all secondary metabolites of fungi. Ethanol is basically yeast poop. Like, we wouldn't have that ethanol without it. Bread, also a yeast thing. Detergents as well. This is a huge market for fungal enzymes. So when you toss your clothes in the laundry machine and you have like food on them, the enzymes that go in and 
like literally take that out of the, the matrix of your clothing or um, depill your, your textiles, so much of that comes from fungi. Medicine as well, um, they are often battling bacteria just like us. So the fungal solution to ward off bacteria sometimes works in our own bodies as well. Penicillin is the classic example of this. Uh, you know, Alexander Fleming left a petri plate open, got contaminated, but then that bacteria didn't come close to the mold. And then, wow, there's like an epic story behind penicillin, like people sending warships or war crafts, aircrafts to go get moldy melons from all over the world just to study and find a strain that produced a ton of penicillin. And then bioreactors became a thing because they needed this antibiotic um, as soon as possible. And of course, we still use it today. Uh, Legos too, that's just like another funny one I wanted to throw in there to show you that fungal metabolites show up in places you really wouldn't um, suspect. So Legos have an ingredient called idaconic acid that comes from some fungi, I don't remember the strain, but Anyway, how people found that and even thought maybe it would be great for your Lego material, no idea. Um, and more lately, pigments are being extracted from a fungi, and that, that is a metabolite as well. So this is a really interesting conversation that we'll get into later on. Um, but now we're going to discuss cultivating fungi. And I'm gonna go over the very basics, but we will touch on some more advanced methods later on. As I mentioned in the email, and we've made pretty clear on the website, everything that you need to grow mushrooms came in your kit, but it is limited in how much control you have with um, the fungus itself and the culture itself. And that's mostly because Cultivating fungi requires equipment, unfortunately, <laughs> most of the time, if you want to really dial in on um, substrates and experimentation. But generally, what people do is they get a culture, and that's something you can purchase from someone online or that you can make yourself. And we'll show you how to do that in the cloning demo. And that usually begins its life on agar. And once that grows out, you can expand it into a liquid culture or a grain spawn. And it sort of depends on what you're working with. Uh, with the basidiomyces that we have, the grain spawn is definitely preferential to liquid culture. And some ascomycotas, you don't want to even mess with grain spawn. Um, and I will have information on how to make your own liquid culture and grain spawn if you do have a pressure cooker or something like that. Um, that you want to be able to make your own, you absolutely can with the techniques that I'll share. Otherwise, pre-poured agar plates, pre-sterilized grain spawns, all of, these, all of these things you can buy from people online. And generally, they're pretty okay. Um, I've definitely gotten contaminated plates and contaminated grain spawn before, but if you're just using it as a one-off or even just you know, you have one project that you want to work on, um, it should be fine. And then you go from grain spawn to your bulk substrate. And I tested the substrate for all three fungi that are included in your kits, and they all did really well on those bricks that you got. Um, and that was exciting because those bricks make mushroom farming so much easier. You all you have to do is add boiling hot water and that is enough to pasteurize the material. Um, you know, otherwise people formulate specific substrates for specific mushrooms. And while that does totally influence the yield and compounds within the fungus, um, that's something that's considered, I think, more advanced because it requires expensive equipment. And I just wanted to show you that you can grow these mushrooms on a firewood brick uh, with some hot water and a bit of patience. So what do fungi need? Uh, they need air, like we talked about before. Um, they breathe in oxygen and let out CO2. So you'll notice the filter bags that you got in your kit have a little patch, and that's to allow gas exchange. 
Um, same with the grain spawn bags that you have. And, you know, fungi, they're not that big. If you did cut their gas exchange off completely, it's not going to kill them. But what it will do is almost halt their growth. And you will notice this the more you work with fungi. If you open up a bag that had been, you know, the filter was poorly made or the micron mesh was just too small, within the next day, you will see how that mycelium takes off. Um, and a way to visualize this I actually noticed was with Pinella stypticus. So I've worked with this fungus enough, just making stuff for the Odin. We sell this pre-inoculated in jars um, and it glows and it's really, really cool. Uh, if, if I had Pinella stypticus in a jar or something that didn't have enough range, and then I brought it into a dark space, and I looked at it, it was glowing really weakly. And then I took the jar lid off and then immediately a bunch of oxygen rushed in. It got brighter within a few seconds. It was really cool to see that. And it was for the first time, me being able to sort of visualize the bio processes of um, what oxygen really is doing for that organism as a whole. But if you use the things that came in your kit, you shouldn't have to worry about dialing in the air um, if you are wanting to get into biotechnology or if you're really inspired to make mushroom leather or something based on um, a lecture I'll give in the following weeks, we can discuss different methods for how to do that. Um, but for now, uh, the, the filter bags, are they suffice just fine. And they need water, uh, but too much water is bad. It can harbor bacteria or it just, the fungus is like, I'm not even going to try. There's not enough or there's, there's too much water and it's diluting my own processes. Um, you, can, you, don't, you can't really drown fungus. Like I grow them in liquid cultures all the time. Um, it's more about the colonization of the substrate. And they need food, of course. So wood is food for fungus. You can give them a log and they'll be pretty happy, but you can also give them straight up dextrose or glucose or very simplistic foods that you give other microorganisms and they'll thrive just as well. Um, that diet is influential on what happens to the fungus. So a lot of mushrooms won't fruit unless they have this one nutrient or they get this opportunity to eat this thing. And they, they're definitely more advanced uh, mushrooms, but for now, the three that you have with the media that we provided, just some sugars and some more um, robust material like the firewood bricks is pretty satisfactory. And they need warmth, but I almost don't like to say that because in our eyes, their preferential temperature range probably doesn't seem warm to a lot of organisms. And there's a lot of people who postulate, a lot of scientists out there who postulate that warm-bloodedness became a thing because of fungal infections. I mean, that our body temperatures are a main reason why we don't get fungal infections um, because their range, 95 is really, really hot for a fungus, way too hot. There are some that can survive up there, but you know, for the ones that would that you're gonna be working with or that you're exposed to on a daily basis, way too hot. Um, and if you, like room temperature is pretty okay for most fungi. Obviously room temperature from one house to another is completely different, but I don't use temperature controlled spaces to fruit my fungi. It's in the lab with everything else. Um, I don't use an incubator, I don't use a cool temp anything for what I'm working with. And it's probably 73 degrees in here, it's fine. So I wouldn't be too concerned about uh, the temperatures. And then they need a fruiting surface. So if you've gone on hikes before, you'll see that some mushrooms grow up from the ground or some grow from the sides of the tree. Uh, they do have directional preferences. They respond to gravity. There are these little crystals in their cell walls that fall with gravity and give the mycelial network um, an idea of their orientation in space. So you could really use that for 
design almost. And what I've seen a few people do and what I've tried myself is like, oh, grow reishi standing up and then, you know, halfway through its life, turn the draw on its side and it'll start growing always up. So you can just play with um, almost sculpting that mushroom based on the orientation of the, the substrate. And yeah, it definitely, you, you can get some fungi to fruit on agar, but it's just this little tiny, very sad mushroom. The more food it has, the more mushrooms you're gonna get. And you'll, you'll notice this yourself, even with uh, the bricks that generally you can equate the, the bulk of the substrate. Um, there's a calculation you can do once you start farming more and more that this much substrate is gonna yield about this much mushroom. So working with fungi, I think it's funny that we are so sterile. Uh, okay, I'm gonna actually gonna answer some of these questions. Do all mushrooms like more acidic pH? No, they don't. Um, some of them do better with lower pHs, but you know, even four is pushing it. Um, but I think neutral pHs are what's preferred. For most fungi that you'll grow. If body tint prevents fungal infections, then cold-blooded animals more prone to them. Yes, absolutely. Reptiles are actually, unfortunately, very prone to fungal infections. Um, bats as well. Yeah, it's there's like white nose disease and other things that are pretty sad, uh, but they're definitely putting up more of a battle when it comes to um, fungal infections. So, we tend to be really sterile when we work with fungi, and that's mostly because we don't understand them. And what we're trying to do is minimize the competition. So you have a, an agar plate with nothing else growing on it, and you put your fungal tissue on there. It doesn't have signals from other organisms that are going to be problematic for it, so it will grow. But if you take a swab, if you went outside and got some rainwater or something and swabbed all of that on the plate, you might have some reishi spores in there or reishi cells, but it's not going to take off, most likely, because there's all of these other organisms that outcompete it for food. So what we do in the lab is try to take away that competition because we don't understand what concentrations of or what ecosystem design is best for that mushroom. However, we know that sterility is not the fungus's preference. I mean, mycorrhizal fungi, things like uh, morels are a great example of this. They do better when there's all sorts of organisms interacting with it. But to recreate that in the lab, we're just really far away from getting anywhere near that. So next best thing we have is to eliminate competition entirely. Um, notes on your agar, because this was actually one of the most difficult parts of putting this kit together was getting the agar to work out because I didn't want you guys to have to use an autoclave. Most of the kits, the Odin, all of them actually that, that make agar or that require you to make agar, you do in the microwave, which is awesome. Microwaves are super accessible, very ubiquitous, um, easy to use. It's great. But we're using a different media. The, LB broth that people use to cultivate E. coli, it's really salty and there's not a ton of sugars. Fungus is not gonna thrive on that media. They need different media. And the media that, that I've been trying to develop isn't selective to Basidiomycete fungi or something. And even if it was, there's still fungal contaminants that would just as much like to eat uh, the media that we use. I tried working with antibiotics and it made it, or antimycotics, it made it worse because obviously if it's an antimycotic, it's antifungal, you know, it, it tends to block some sort of cell wall construction in the fungus and that's bad for the one we're trying to farm as well. Um, we do add antibiotics though, and that helps a lot. So you shouldn't see any bacterial contamination with your plates. The thing you're gonna see most likely is um, Trichoderma or penicillin, which is a green mold. It's very identifiable. You'll know pretty much right away if you have it. Um, but some things to 
keep your agar in, in the best condition is if you have an autoclave, do that instead of microwaving it. Um, the video will go into more of this and how to do it. Basically, you just want to microwave it a lot. Don't just bring it to a boil once, but four to five times. And then um, making sure you're in a clean space. Uh, like I said, we added antibiotics. If you pour your plates and you don't use them right away, put them in the fridge because most likely there is something living in or on the agar, but you can halt it. And the idea is that you put your specimen or clone on the agar that you do want, and it wins the race for, um, you know, eating the, the food in the agar. And it just, it, you want it, you want to increase the, the success rate for your fungus against um, any contaminants. And that's also why we gave you seven plates. Um, I think if when you do a clone, I would clone, maybe make five plates and you should get one clean one out of that if uh, your technique is good. And then another thing you'll notice is I gave, in the kit you have four grain bags and four bricks, but only three cultures. So that fourth one is up to you. It's either there for you to start over if something went wrong with the other three, or if you wanna clone your own fungi, if you find one, like a mushroom when you go on a walk or something, or go to the store and get an oyster mushroom that you wanna try growing, you can use that substrate uh, to propagate. And you can go from your agar plate to uh, the grain spawn and then into the brick. Um, Okay, aseptic techniques. Uh, I'm gonna we're gonna transition to the demo soon, so I'll just walk you through like how to work with really any organism, um, but especially with fungi. So wearing gloves and a mask that helps a lot. Um, the one thing you did not get in your kit is isopropyl alcohol or a cleaning agent. So definitely make sure that you have that before you start any of this stuff. Um, you can find it at drugstores. I mean, we should all be pretty familiar with isopropyl alcohol after the pandemic, but 70% is the lowest concentration you I would recommend using. I do prefer 90 because it evaporates faster. Um, but get a hold of that. I like to put it in a spray bottle because it allows you to get your space cleaner faster and just be more accurate with um, your wipe downs and things. Uh, wipe down the surface that you're working on. Wipe down the tools. So you got a dissection kit and we're gonna use that to make um, a clone or to, to get a tissue sample. And the blades come sterile, wrapped. So you don't have to clean it the first time you use it, but it, when you do reuse it, always uh, clean your tools. I actually have a little jar of isopropyl that I leave my tools soaking in until I'm ready to use them. Um, and then try to work in a clean space. So just be mindful of where you are. Like don't work in a shed, don't work outside. Um, if you have air conditioning or heat or a fan or something, that's not good. You wanna keep the air as still as possible. Uh, if you have ever seen the raking light come through the window and you see like all of the particles in the air, that gives you an idea of just how dirty the air is, right? And when you open your Petri plates, it's exposed to that air. So to minimize that, um, keeping the airflow to a minimum um, is gonna be your friend, unless you have something like a flow hood. I have two behind me here. And what a flow hood is, is just a big fan that blows air through a filter. It's called a HEPA filter, a high efficiency particulate something. And it filters out anything bigger than like 0 0.03 microns. So nothing alive is getting through that. It's just air at this point, it's sterile air. So I'm, I'm constantly being blown in the face with, with my flow hoods, but the air is sterile. And that is definitely gonna increase your success rate if you're uh, working with fungi a lot. Um, I sent an email out before the class that gave you a list of equipments or possibilities if you do wanna buy something like this. Um, you can also talk to me 
it's definitely worth doing your research and buying something that works for you and that's in your budget. Um, you can build them as well if you have that kind of technique or skill. Um, but yeah, another trick that I like to do in a still air space, I'm not going to use my flow hood today, so you'll see that it's definitely possible to do these techniques um, without it, is take a lighter, turn on the lighter, flick it on. And if the flame is going crazy, the airflow is like, try and find a spot where the flame looks really still. Then you'll know that the airflow is at a minimum. And then it's up to you to maintain that. Because obviously, when you're bringing your hands and, and moving, um, you are moving the air around you. But you can be strategic about that and like keep the airflow behind your work or, or not above it, for example. Um, some other tricks if you're trying to bypass buying equipment is minimizing the sugar in your substrate. So part of the reason that those bricks work so well is that there's not a lot of things that'll eat bricks or um, like sawdust. Fungi love it. They do great with that. But if you added a bunch of sugar to your brick or, or starch or something that was really, really nutrient dense, suddenly all the other bacteria and, and living organisms in there are going to have an opportunity to thrive because there's a food source for them that they know how to consume and will consume. Um, so minimizing the sugar in your substrate is definitely a technique. And then there's something called tendalization, which is basically what I'm gonna have you do with the agar. Proper tendalization, you wait many hours or days between um, heat cycles but I've made this agar enough to know that if you boil it in the, the microwave, let it ch chill for a couple minutes and do it again and again about five times. Um, yeah, the, the idea is that you heat up the substrate, you almost give the contaminants an opportunity to germinate or, or freak out, um, and then you kill them again when they're, or you, you heat it up again after they have germinated because now they're more vulnerable to uh, things like that. So now we're going to get into the demos. Does anyone have any questions before we proceed? No? OK. All right, can you all see the space pretty well? So. Once you have poured plates, uh, tune back into this part of the video and you can follow along. But I've got my plates here. I'm gonna wear a mask and gloves. And the first thing I'm gonna do is wipe down my space. So I always spray my hands, uh, spray the surface that I'm working on, even like the parafilm that will cut. Uh, I give a spritz, the scissors. Um, the, what I'm gonna use to clone, what I recommend is the, the scalpel with the blade. Um, Again, the blade comes sterile, but the the holder for it is not. So just make sure you wipe that down. And this step is really, really important for wild mushrooms. So if you are in the woods and you're like, wow, that's a beautiful reishi mushroom. I want to grow that. It's probably covered in other organisms. So what you're going to do is something called surface sterilizing which is basically like you make a burrito of, uh, of your specimen and you wrap it in a paper towel dosed in ethanol. And this is from the grocery store, so it's definitely way less clean or more clean. But uh, I usually let that just kind of soak for 30 seconds to a minute. You do want to be really mindful of the specimen itself. Like this is a meaty specimen. It's so big that when I wipe down the surface 
with alcohol, I'm definitely killing these cells, but there's so many other cells because the chances of the alcohol soaking through and killing everything is minuscule. If you have something really, really small, you want to be much more careful with your timing and you have less flexibility and less uh, opportunities to make a tissue culture. So, you know, just, just consider these things. And if you're doing this just to practice, I do recommend something more meaty. If you are foraging and you find a patch of mushrooms that you want to clone, go for the biggest one. It's just going to be easier to work with. So what I would actually do if I was just like doing this myself, I take this top off because there's so much texture here that there's a lot of opportunities for microbes to be hiding. I'm not even going to mess with it. This, however, has less surface area and I have more chances to get uh, clean tissue. So got your surface sterilized mushroom. And rather than cutting it open, because your blade is gonna go through it, then you touch the inside with something. You can bypass touching the inside with something just by ripping it. So what I usually do is rip it open. Now, so far, nothing has made contact with that tissue. Um, Christopher, I you could, but I would just recommend um, buying isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, I, I misspoke. Ethanol, if you use really clean ethanol, it will work, but it's going to be a lot more expensive and, uh, yeah, kind of a waste. I wouldn't use other alcohols that you would drink because they tend to have sugars in them, and that can be problematic. Okay, another thing to be mindful of, when you get your scalpel, if you did soak it in alcohol, and then you go in to get your tissue sample, every cell that it touches is gonna kill. So I usually wait for it to evaporate. And my trick for that is to just like move the blade a little bit and light, and you can actually watch those little drops of isopropyl slowly evaporate, and eventually it's dry and sterile. And then you don't need much at all, like even a microscopic amount will be enough to clone. But just, you know, cut a tiny piece like this. And then after I cut it out of the matrix, I usually stab it. I have my plates here. And then I clamshell the plate away from me or if there's airflow or something, just take that into consideration and try and aim it towards the least active spot. So just do that, wipe it on the agar and hopefully it drops off your blade quickly and sits in the agar. Um, what I'll do a lot of the times to save plates, and if I know I'm gonna get contamination, um, you, can, you can isolate from there. Like you'll get a colony that grows and there's not contamination and you'll get one that does have contamination and you just keep isolating the tissue until you have something clean. But I'll rotate the plate and do a, a, a few, uh, tissue clones, just to increase my chances. So I've got that. Now this has been open for a while, so I would probably start again with um, new tissue. So I'll rip it another direction. Here's tissue that has not been exposed to outside air yet. Just cut a little bit, stab it clamshell the plate, wipe it on the agar, close the lid. This, most people with the parafilm strips, you got them in this shape. Uh, cut them once. This is all you need to close the plates. You also got more than seven because I've found that parafilm takes some time to get used to. Uh, but... To close it, it kind of works like cling wrap or something. The part that is against the paper is the part that you want to do facing the lid. 
So this side of the parafilm has been exposed to the outside air. You want that on the outside of your Petri plate. Um, and what you're gonna do, carefully pick up the plate. I like to use my dominant hand to pull the parafilm, but I hold it with one finger at the start, pull it, and then just press it against the plate because sometimes it can unstick. Yeah, and then you've got your plate and it should be protected from anything on the outside. And then labeling, um, it's kind of personal preference. Most people in biology store their stuff upside down and label the bottom. Makes a total sense because if you lose the lid, then you don't know what the agar had. But if you're careful, um, I tend to just label the lid, especially because if I did turn this over, the tissue would probably fall off. Um, but I'll label what we're working with. This is a king oyster. The date. And then the type of agar, if you do work with a lot of different agars, uh, this is MEA plus, plus sign, just to denote that it has canamycin in it. And if you're really getting into fungal culturing and tissueing, you want to label the generation because there is something called senescence and you can't take a fungal tissue and just keep growing it forever and ever. Like you, you can get a long way with that, but you wanna make sure that you keep, if you're, if you're farming or something, like go back to more fresh plates. So if this is a clone, a wild clone, you can label it clone or you can label it P0. Uh, that's for whatever reason, just like what the industry uses. It's like P3 plate zero. Um, and the next time you do a transfer, that would be P1, P2, P3. So you can keep track of how many times you moved that network. Um, and there will be a document um, in the class that goes over some labeling. Okay. Opus, can mycelium grow on agar from dehydrated fruit? Um, sure it could, but in order to get the fruit, the, the mycelium to grow from the fruit, you would want to reduce the contaminants, which to do that, you'd probably kill the, the target fungus. Um, but one thing you could do is just like scrape off the skin of the dehydrated fruit and see what grows and keep isolating from there. And maybe you are trying to grow the contaminant. Like trichoderma is definitely not something that we want, but there's people who have trich farms because it's so good for plant soil. Um, okay. So that's the cloning demo. Now I'm going to show you what to do with your syringes. So this is what you got in your kit. You've got your syringe, you should have gotten a needle to go with it, and four grain bags. And this is really easy. It's not susceptible to contamination if you're, you know, have some common sense. And this is like the method I've told all of my friends who just want to grow like one thing of mushrooms ever. Super simple. This comes sterile. This is sterile inside. The culture is also sterile other than the, the fungus that, that we grow in it. So what you want to do, spray down the area, spray the injection port because that's where the needle is going to go in. And if you imagine some sort of contamination on here, and then you force the needle through, you're gonna be taking it with you into the grain. So just make sure that that part's clean, that your hands are clean, and let the alcohol dry for a second. So what I generally do is get a head start with opening the needle. And you wanna open it from the back end where the pink part is. So open that, take the lure lock tip off, put this one on, and now you have your injectable syringe. Again, this is sterile, so you don't have to wipe it down. You just take the top cap off, you're gonna push it once in there. Don't keep stabbing it over and over, just do it once. 
And then you're going to use the plunger to squirt the liquid culture in. And you can kind of move it around a little bit just to give the fungus more of a head start in colonizing the entire grain. So depending on how mature your liquid culture is will depend on how fast your grain spawn colonizes. You'll notice this probably that one culture is going to grow faster than the other. A lot of that's biology. A lot of that's just the maturity of the liquid culture. You can actually observe your syringes and some of them are going to have a little bit more mycelium than the others because of the timing. And then I label it. And because later I'm going to be spraying this down with isopropyl, the Sharpie will rub off. So I label the filter because it, it will stay. It will get messed up a little bit if you spray the alcohol on it, but if you label like oyster up here and then sprayed it with alcohol, it would just like immediately wipe away and you would not know what was in here anymore. So we used Ganoderma. So I'm gonna just label it Ganoderma. And the date on the filter patch like this. And you want to just store it in a cool, dark place. Uh, I use a box under my bench. It's nothing fancy. And yeah, I would recommend that all of you guys do that today. So that next week uh, we can look at them and just make sure that they are growing nicely. I doubt that they'll be ready to move onto the bricks for another couple weeks, but we'll see. Um, I'll give you an example of what mature uh, grain spawn does look like, but it should turn all fluffy and white. I'll just go get an example. So this is about two weeks old, and yeah, there's a lot of mycelium. This is ready. I, I would be prepared to put this into your uh, bricks. So is the culture in the needle made from what was originally plated? Uh, yes. I believe if what you're asking is um, the cultures that I either bought or cloned, I put into a liquid, grew them up in a jar like this and just made syringes out of that. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, your Panella stipticus culture, just by the way, that's the glowing one. Uh, you won't see it in liquid unfortunately. And that actually might be a fun one to try and plate. So if you squirt a little, you can ju just squirt a little bit of that liquid culture out onto a plate. Um, it'll look something like this. And it, it will glow. You can see it on that. Yeah. The glowing. Okay, cool, Jewel. You've, you've had it for a while. How to make it fruits? Um, I'm still working on that. It's always taken a while like i think the soonest i saw something fruit was four months and that's always been in substrates that are a little like like this um it's funny because you can't see a lot of mycelium but it glows really well and it will fruit even though it doesn't fully colonize nearly as much as like reishi So this is the reishi strain that you guys got, the Ganoderma. And when it colonizes the substrate, it gets this really nice, white, fluffy material. Phenella stipticus just looks like a jar of dirt. Um, adding starch helps. So you will see that you have starch in your media kit, and we'll go over next week, or probably the week after, actually, what to do with that. That's something you're going to add after the brick has been inoculated and grown out a little bit. Um, the starch, the Pinellas Tipticus loves it so much. Um, it'll kick off a little faster, glow brighter, and um, last longer. Will there be more Primordia if you read it? <laughs> yeah, I think so, Opus. I really do. The, the secret ingredient is definitely love. 
Um, is 40 degrees Fahrenheit the right temp to store liquid culture for the moment? Yeah, so if you want to just keep your liquid culture chilling until you're ready to use it, keeping it in the fridge will extend its shelf life. If you plan on using it in the next couple of weeks, it's fine to keep it in room temperature. Um, but if you're gonna be sitting on that for longer, I definitely recommend the refrigerator. And then before you use it, so if you wanna take your liquid culture syringe out and right away inoculate your bags, you can do that, but it might be more gentle to the fungus to let it warm up a little bit before you do it. And if anyone has like requests for topics that you want to go over within the mycology stuff, uh, let me know because those classes haven't happened yet and I'm happy to spend some extra time on a certain topic if, if that's something you're really interested in. Okay, um, only 10 minutes over, that's not too bad. Yeah, keep an eye out for the videos that will be uploaded to the class one before the end of the day. We'll show you how to make the agar and just have a little bit more information in general. Um, otherwise, I'll be available by email and I'll see you next week. Same time, Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to expand cultures and it'll be super fun. Are there any plans to work for lion's mane mushrooms? Yeah, so I should have mentioned this. The, the techniques that I'm showing you in this class work for most cultivatable mushrooms. So if you do exactly what we do for these fungi with a lion's mane culture, you can grow them pretty successfully. Okay, I'll give 30 more seconds for any remaining questions. Cool, well, thank you guys so much. Pleased to have 24 people in, it's more than signed up, so that's pretty awesome. Yes, you can email through the Odin website. You should have gotten an email from me directly too. It's just lira at the-odin.com um, and you can respond to that. And I'll, I'll usually answer within 24 hours, if not earlier. Uh, yeah, Christopher, I would keep your stuff in the fridge until you're ready to use it. Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, I'll see you next week and send a follow up at some point. Um, if you didn't, Mark, email me. I'll double check that I sent it to you too. And if not, I'll just uh, resend it. So, okay. Enjoy your Sunday. Thanks for sticking with me and appreciate you guys being here.